What if I told you that this bag of dog food could save the planet? Now, I know what you're thinking. Why would anybody willingly sit and watch a video about dog food? Unless, of course, you were, well, a dog. After countless hours of research, I discovered something profoundly impactful for our pets, our planet, and ourselves. And it all starts with what's inside this bag. But before we open this up, let's start at the top. What even is regular dog food? Do you know what's in kibble? Uh, pretty much garbage. I don't know. I read it, but you know, God knows, I don't know. A little Talking concerning. Bad, yeah. yeah. Is cancer and death not good for your dog? I think these An companies idea. put chemicals in their food that get your dog or cat addicted to their food. Kind of sounds like what they do to us too. So that's, right? yeah, so that's why we rotated. <laughs> okay, most people don't really know what they feed their pets. If you thought pink goo chicken nuggets and Wuhan wet markets were bad, you are not gonna wanna know what goes inside of Fido's kibble. So that brings me back to this bag in three words, lab grown meat. Now I know lab grown meat gets a bad rap, probably because their ugly demented cousin plant-based meat hasn't fared too well. But there's a better name for the former that more accurately describes what's going on, cultivated meat. It's actual animal fats and proteins grown from cell cultures that are almost identical in nutrition profile to the real thing. The whole lot less deforestation, animal cruelty, and other questionable ingredients involved. Lab-grown or cultivated meat has three major challenges to overcome. It doesn't look like the real thing, its safety and efficacy isn't fully understood, and it's incredibly expensive. You thought Wagyu was pricey? Somebody paid $330,000 to make this lab-grown burger 10 years ago. That's like 70,000 Big Macs. So how do we solve these three problems? And how does it relate to pet food? Well, these billionaires wouldn't pick up my calls for the video, but between Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and Richard Branson, big investors are throwing in hundreds of millions of dollars to find out how to do cultivated meat the right way. And as I looked into this space more, I realized this wasn't just a hot new trend. This space had been quietly growing for years, and getting it right means a lot of major things for our civilization. Millions of animal lives spared every year from the industrial meat industry, a massive reduction in foodborne illnesses and factory farmer worker exploitation, and allowing places like the Amazon rainforest to go back to housing wild species and capturing CO2 instead of just, you know, being a clear cut field for cows to shit in. But while I couldn't get one of those billionaires to pick up my call between all their windsurfing and yacht parties, there was one company that answered my calls, and their approach to solving these three major problems was completely different. Different. This is Mitchell, and he runs a company called Cult Food Science. My name is uh, Mitchell Scott, CEO of Cult Food Science. I'm helping shift the world into a new way of uh, producing food. Mitchell, can you tell me which one of these is lab-grown meat and which one's real meat? They both look almost the exact same. I'm gonna say this is the lab-grown meat one. Okay, you got it right. If you can tell this is lab-grown meat, yep. what about the dogs. Do they care about how the meat looks? I don't think they care how the meat looks. There's a difference between getting a steak or a juicy burger or a piece of sashimi versus a dog treat or a dog food that has all the nutritional benefits and similar taste and texture. Why then are you starting with pet food versus going straight into the good old burgers and humans? Yeah. With pet food, we're able to, to harvest the cells earlier. You know, margins are better in pet food, so there's a way for us to actually launch products that are, are profitable from day one. 30% of our current meat supply goes into pet food, and it's not the prime cuts, it's whatever is left over. These animals living in pretty squalid conditions, being pumped full of hormones. Cultivated meat or lab-grown meat, it's much cleaner. It's a big sta stainless steel bioreactor, similar to brewing beer. You can kind of control outside factors, and at the end of the day, you can get the exact same product in terms of look, taste, texture, but made in a cleaner, safer way. 10 years ago, this Dutch company came out with the first lab-grown meat burger, 400,000 Canadian or something crazy. Wow. That same company is making that same burger, obviously, you know, improved for about just under 20 bucks a burger. That's still expensive for a burger, you know, it's not quite there, but it's come a remarkable way over the past 10 years. I think very soon, like within the next couple of years, we're gonna have products that look the same, taste the same, are identical on a cellular level, and are priced very, very similarly. It is gonna happen um, sooner rather than later. Cult's big idea is to start with dogs and cats. 
By using the same technology that creates lab-grown meat, cellular agriculture, and combining it with nutritional yeast, they claim to have developed a ultra-high protein and vitamin-rich pet food that actually has a higher nutrition profile than any other dry pet food on the market. So let's crunch the numbers. 65 billion, how much in pet food sales were just made in the USA? 67% of American households own a dog or cat, and 30% of all meat in America is consumed by cats and dogs. And if you gave all those American cats and dogs their own country, it would be the fifth highest meat consuming nation on earth. But here's the burning question. Do animals actually like these cultivated products? And is it even good for them? Mark Binns, one of Cult's lead advisors, gave me the scoop. Do you feed your dog new cheese? Absolutely, this is Abby. She likes new cheese uh, whenever she wants a treat. It's one of the first things she looks for in the cover. Abby, Abby, Abby. Is, he, is he paying you to say that? Is he paying you? Just no. in new cheese. How do we actually know that this cultivated meat is good for dogs. Things grown in a lab, people have a lot of concerns about the efficacy. Like what have you done, I guess, from the science and verification perspective that will give reassurance that this is actually good for dogs or cats? Yeah, cool. Cult has a animal nutritionist that they work with that'll be working with the FDA in the United States to do feeding trials. Same way if you introduce a new drug uh, for humans, you have to go through a whole process. If you look at Cult as a whole, is it just new cheese that is the one product that you have in the portfolio that's actually being sold to market right now? Yeah, it is the brand uh, that has multiple products that we have in market generating revenue. We also have all the portfolio companies that we've invested in and that can create significant value for shareholders down the road as there's exits, could be IPOs, et cetera. But from a revenue generating point of view that we can include in our p and it is new cheese. It's all about scaling now, right? So we've, we've been raising capital and we're putting that capital to work to market new cheese to Canadian and American pet owners. All right, so I'm sold on it for the most part. But if this is everything it's cracked up to be, how do you actually compete with existing pet food behemoths? I gotta ask you this, this question might be a little bit you know, tricky. Yeah. You mess with the wrong people, you end up like a Boeing whistleblower. Yeah. How do you make sure that doesn't happen to new cheese? How does how do you avoid the dog and cat food industrial complex coming and, and crushing you guys? Good question. And I think Pet is interesting in that regard because conglomerates like Purina and Mars own hundreds of brands. They own much of the industry. So once you get to a certain size, all of a sudden you're an acquisition target. In terms of getting stamped out, the risk is more on the political front. Like you've heard about lab grown meat being banned in Florida and Al Alabama there's more risk there. I think it's actually a good thing. It's a sign that people are scared. They're paying attention to the space. The two largest meat producers in the world on the human side are building out cultivated meat facilities. So I really think it is, you know, the future of, of our food system. And you're gonna see more and more of these products, you know, coming to market in the coming years. Even 95 years ago, Winston Churchill saw a future with lab-grown meat, predicting, we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. Humans are always going to be picky when it comes to culinary experiences. It's going to be really hard to grow an amazing T-bone steak without a cow or a chicken wing without a chicken. But when it comes to pet food, cultured ingredients are not only meeting the taste and nutrition test, but the cost test too. The same way AI is already radically disrupting retail and customer service, or how crypto is already disrupting remittances and payment rails, lab-grown meat could disrupt the entire food industry. It's no longer a dream of Churchill's or a billionaire science experiment either. The FDA just approved lab-grown meat for sale in the United States. Singapore is already selling it in butcher shops. Countries like Israel have approved it. And yes, it's even considered kosher. And if it succeeds there, it opens the floodgates for so much more. As for me, my two furry friends are already pretty content with hay, bananas, and banana peels. Don't ask. But if you and your pet are among the millions working towards a greener, healthier planet, take another look at the changing landscape of lab-grown meat and how it might change the way the world thinks about food. We're really trying to shift the world's food system into this new way of producing food.